Charles the guy, not just to come out of the boy. Hey, you oh, you wore my thing for it. Gentlemen, you can't fight in here. This is the war room. What is it? <laughs> Shabbat Shalom, Bruchim Abayim. I'm Rabbi Paul, your virtual rabbi. You have found Beit for Chuali, and let's stir up a little Torah together. And let's start with something that is not meant to be a hard question. What room are you in right now? Okay, if you are in a physical room, this should be obvious, but say it out loud anyway. Make it conscious. I'm in this living room. I'm in the kitchen. I'm still in the bedroom. Don't judge me. If you are not inside, or let's say not in a traditional room, Let's play the game anyway and turn our surroundings into a conceptual room. I am in the moving room of my car, for example, but if that's the case, I hope that you are either not driving or that if you are listening to this, that you're listening to this as a podcast and not looking at my face for my face is not worth that danger. But hey, perhaps it's on the slopes of, say, Mount Rainier, which as Parshat Bo is right in the wintertime, it's fairly unlikely, but let's pretend and perhaps then the answer is, I'm in the glorious dome or cathedral of the Pacific Northwest. Be creative, but humor me. Name it out loud. What room are you in? Okay, if we've gotten this far, then we can start to shift into the metaphorical. The first step is to name, once again aloud, the physical room, which isn't the bathroom, as that's another type of discussion altogether, that you spend a lot of time in, and simultaneously you place the most limits regarding on who may join you in that space. For some of us, this may be the kitchen. How dare you taste my sauce before it's done? How dare you criticize the amount of garlic that I use? For others, like my wife and I that live as proud hermits, it is the living room which acts as a refuge from life that just can feel too much. Other than the fact that few would actually want to drive so far as to find us in the first place, we make the decision to keep that room ours, or probably more accurately, our cats, not out of misanthropy, but out of preservation. We have visitors, just not often, and for reasons both physical and energetic, it takes a lot to get into that space. Which leads us to the next exercise, which starts getting to the critical points. Can we name who we want in that most sacred space with us, and who we allow? For you universal extroverts out there, your answer will contain a much longer list than mine. But make this conscious. Name these people out loud, even if the answer, which is completely loud and utterly, for some people, logical, whoever rings the bell. If that's the case, name it, because it's probably not completely true. Because also then allow in, at the same time, the more powerful question than who is not allowed in, even if they should ring the bell, and why. It may be painful to say out loud, as excluded individuals may have just earned their exclusion with reprehensible behavior. Or maybe not. Are we willing to be honest? Maybe we just don't like a specific group or a type. No clarinetists welcome would, of course, be absolutely silly, especially as we clarinetists are pretty awesome folk. But this naming exercise alone can force us into some powerful truths, and if we have made it this far in the exercise, this act of naming alone can make it worth it. If this leads to us making conscious something that exists because of something that has not been consciously examined. For those of us with a <clears throat> smaller set of allowed guests, the names become individuals and probably fall into two general categories. Those that I want or even need in that space and those that I am obligated to let into that space. I do like my in-laws, however, so even though sometimes relatives fall into that second category, no one should be making any assumptions that I am trying to make an underlying point. For those of us that do not by ourselves, for those of us that do not alone choose the human contents of our room, such as those of us with partners or roommates, notice, however, the potential conflict if the sets of inclusions for me and my roommate or partner differ. This is why we are naming everything out loud. What seems so obvious in the moment is exactly what those of us that work in the therapeutic world try sometimes over months to tease out into the open to help resolve conflicts. Partner X wants daily parental visits. Partner Y doesn't get along with maybe one of those parents and prefers that their own parents come, say, oh, once a decade. What seems obvious seldom actually is. It just seems so because we haven't taken the time to say it out loud and begin the process of actually dealing with it. Partner X and Y, with these room requirements, needs and expectations kept unspoken, 
will not long remain partners. Which finally moves us into the powerful underlying metaphorical space of Parashat Bo. In Bo, it is easy to get caught up in some of the most dramatic events of the Torah narrative, such as, oh, the final three plagues and the hasty journey out of Egypt. The problem with these dramatic events, however, is that they are, well, dramatic. Who doesn't like a Hollywood thriller? Yet the more that the action in a specific movie, a specific thriller, you know, like cows flying in tornadoes, for example, moves us away from tangible everyday experience, the more it has the potential of existing only as entertainment and not dialogue. If we read the story in the Torah, as we will later on in the Torah narrative of, for example, siblings talking smack against each other, we can transport that easily into our lives and think about it as who of us have not had someone close to us that we have found out has been talking smack about us. Oh yes, and who of us has not done that ourselves to someone else that's close to us. But plagues? Past the somewhat inappropriate popcorn. Inappropriate because the let's call it entertainment that we are imbibing, and yet from which we are emotionally distancing ourselves, is about human suffering. It's just that it's the human suffering of the other political party or identity group, so that's become okay, right? Torah has never, however, been meant to be read solely on the surface or literal level. The entire story of these dramatic plagues that seem to have no relationship with our lives can be read as a discussion regarding what it takes to change our minds and the minds of those around us. Spoiler alert, there are 10 plagues, meaning the Torah speaks the truth that we, in most circumstances, do not change, nor do we change our minds unless we are forced to. Forced to meaning 10 plagues. You don't believe me? All right, let's just play it out at the metaphorical level for just a few of them. Let's say I'm in a job or a relationship that is toxic to me. None of us have ever experienced that, right? Well, every instinct when I am in such a job or a relationship says that I need to move on. And yet the loss of security of the known is for so many of us at that time, in that moment, simply too much for us to contemplate overcoming. Plague one the water turns to blood. Water is the universal symbol for emotion and relation. Emotion when functioning at its purest is clear. When it's being used against us is abusive. It's toxic. It becomes polluted with the injury our soul is enduring. It bleeds. Yet no one will ever love me as much as that person. I know this because they tell this to me all the time. So, plague two, frogs appear. Frogs archetypally relate to birth and rebirth, and more importantly, the shoulder shrugging we experience when confronting cycles that we perceive we cannot control. Frogs appear in greater and then lesser and then no numbers cyclically and cause poets like Yeats to exclaim, I am content to live with it again and yet again, if it be life to pitch into the frog spawn of blind man's ditch. At some point, we are going to realize that we are in pain because we are following the same toxic cycle, patterns of the last relationship and the one before that and the one before that. Try this now with the next plague, lice. You know, things that gnaw at us and exist on us because we are not willing to confront the emotional filth that is piling up around us. Everything's okay. Everything's all right. It has to be. Do I still need to convince anyone that it isn't just as easy to continue doing this with flies, pestilence, boils, hail, locusts, darkness, and finally, the horror of the killing of the firstborn? That one you say? What's that about? Well, you know, the part of us that is the most hoped for and the most creative expression of our humanity that we finally let die in order to stay safe in that toxic relationship. Torah can be read literally, but can we please begin taking seriously its life-changing power when we understand the truth of its symbols? Which brings us back to the rooms. There is a telling verse near the beginning of Parshat Bo where we learn that the people surrounding Pharaoh had had enough with the suffering. What a surprise! Pharaoh's courtiers said to him, How long shall this one meaning Moses, be a snare to us. Let the people go worship the eternal their God. Are you, Pharaoh, not yet aware that Egypt is lost? I am slightly curious how long that or those courtiers lasted after that. And this is especially fascinating, considering that at the very beginning of the Parsha, we are told that it is not only Pharaoh's heart that has been hardened, 
but it's also those same courtiers. Yet hardening of the heart is also not literal. It is the expression Torah uses to point out the truth of our existence that when told something we don't want to hear, we double down. A bearded dude in the sky is not zapping Pharaoh's heart. The nature of existence is that we choose to believe what we want to believe regardless of contrary evidence. Hardening of heart. Of course, the courtiers, who are obligated to believe that Pharaoh is a god, will have had their hearts hardened. There's not a whole lot to gain by contradicting a human in general, how much more so contradicting someone who everyone thinks is God. A personal favorite dramatic example would be Stanley Kubrick's 1964 anti-war classic Dr. Strangelove or How I Learned to Stop Worrying and Love the Bomb, which, come on, is a delicious title. Beyond the irony of brilliant lines such as, Gentlemen, you can't fight in here, this is the war room. Dr. Strangelove shows us via parody and parable the danger of filling our rooms with people who will not elevate us via disagreement or offering perspectives that have not already been ideologically vetted for that space. The war room is filled with people who either want war, who's pretending to not want war is moral posturing to cover up for a desire to want war, or who are too weak or too ideologically captured to stand up to the lust for conquest that dominates that space. Now, take a contradictory example of a room. This one, the jury deliberation room in Sidney Lumet's 1957 Twelve Angry Men. The only monolithic idea in that specific space is the desire to get out of that room as quickly as possible. Hey. Looks like we'll be here for dinner, huh? Yet the catalyst of a disagreeable personality or two and the willingness to ask uncomfortable questions. It was another apartment. It's not that easy to identify a voice, particularly a yeah, shouting voice. Then... This isn't a game. Did you see him? Hey. A nerve. Not only regarding the trial, but as well the unethical driving desire of some in the room to get out of that room, even at the expense of a man's life and freedom, turns the room into one where the truth is elevated. It becomes elevated, and each person in that place became elevated through this sacred process of dialogue, of disagreement, of filling a room with differing opinions. In Judaism, we call it mechloket, mechloket l'shem shemaim. our arguments elevated for the sake of heaven. And so the obvious and painfully uncomfortable iterative question is the same as before. Who do we allow into our room? This time, however, I am not talking about the sacred kitchen or the living room refuge. This time I am talking about the spiritual space where I have either surrounded myself with a hallelujah chorus that might eventually contradict me when I have reached the last three of ten plagues and they as well are being dragged down in my need to always be right, or I have surrounded myself with people who might actually call me on my BS. One of my dearest friends, who incidentally has not only had historical permission to, but has in fact on more than one occasion called me on my BS, once uttered the truth that transformed my personal concept of a spiritual war room. If you are the smartest one in a room, you're in the wrong room. Coming from someone with essentially a genius level IQ, this may sound like posturing until you see that they have actually followed through with this by surrounding themselves always with people with different kinds of intelligence. And when you are in that room, you are always allowed to disagree. It's not always pleasant as there is never rollover and there's always pushback, kind of as it's supposed to be. But there's also love and generosity for being part of their sacred space with that spoken and unspoken understanding and participating actively in that space. It's also very humbling. So then back to Moses and Pharaoh. In many ways, this entire prelude to the Exodus narrative highlights two different rooms or two different types of rooms, war rooms, if you will, one in ascendancy and the other in a process of collapse. One. 12 angry human beings and the other Dr. Strangelove. The nature of Pharaoh's room, Dr. Strangelove's war room, we have already looked at and hopefully understand the inevitable narrative end of this Pharaoh's reign. As easily predictable as when we watched the fighting in Strangelove's war room, the bomb was inevitably going to be ridden like a cowboy. Hey, what about Major Kong? <laughs> So now let's look at the composition of the other room, the one with Moses calling out, let my people go. First in that room, in that sacred space, we have Moses himself. It may not have always been for laudable reasons, but his base position and starting assumption is that he is not capable of performing the task, 
at least not alone. And if that sounds somewhat non-ideal for a leader, he does his best, nonetheless, with humility, and more importantly, the recognition that he will be required to do things such as public speaking that are not his métier. Enter Aaron, and symbolically, someone that balances us out as none of us can exist without the dialogue and encounter with another who possesses different strengths and weaknesses. The spinning out of the Exodus narrative requires religious leadership as well as political, and at an archetypal level, Aaron symbolizes the magician, or the expression of external focus spiritual power, while Moses represents the high priestess, archetypally, or the inward focused spiritual power. The two together allow for transformation that one alone cannot bring about. In other traditions, this could be an expression of the yin yang, but then add Alshlosha Devarim upon three things the world stands, and then add the eternal as the third element in Moses' room, not as a bearded, anthropomorphic, quasi-human, but rather as a radical inner connectivity, the universal desire to push beyond our smallest thoughts and greatest fears of any given moment. That is a heck of a place, and now remember that the Hebrew word for place is makom, which is also in the Talmud a name of God, and you start to really get it. Now, Look at what happens to these two rooms, these two places. Pharaoh starts at the top as the head of the most powerful world empire and ends at collapse. Moses's begins with failure and little hope, but with the just cause behind it of an enslaved people that are in need of liberation. What if Moses had said to Aaron or the eternal, yep, I can do it all. And no, I don't need to hear your contradictory ideas. What if Pharaoh had said, I need to build my empire around empowering people to be the best they can be and my own ego around the truth that I need to hear other expert ideas, pay attention to them, and make the land better through them. Sound impossible? Notice that the Joseph story contained exactly that Pharaoh. Notice what happened in that story to Egypt. Then remember the critical words at the beginning of Exodus. Another Pharaoh arose that did not know Joseph. How critical are those words becoming? What happens to us when we forget Joseph? That we once needed people to help us, even if that help was contradiction of what our ego tells us must be true. There is a final cautionary tale in all of this. For all the consciousness we may develop regarding who we invite into our rooms, there's also the issue of how we step into others' rooms uninvited. This is particularly challenging in the current environment while under the influence of how algorithms work. In order to keep us online for just a few seconds longer, we will be presented with a post that is guaranteed to make us step into another type of room with a thousand of our closest friends and dearest enemies that we have never met so that we can type in a tone of voice fit only for a drunken brawl. And that's normal. Consciousness of presence in a room includes consciousness of when it is our room and when it's not. And if not, what is our contract in that space? Even in the most Wild West online spaces, I will make the ethical argument that there are lines that should not be crossed, but regularly are. A post about being in mourning, for example, can be placed online for the sake of passing on information while simultaneously calling for community emotional support. I'm not commenting on if this is or is not ideal and if the expectation is or is not realistic, simply that this is now a default action for many. Notwithstanding, if I, in my moment of downtroddenness, utter a phrase that has fallen out of favor with one group or another, is that post, that moment, that room, the best time to comment on how much we need to be re-educated. How bad we are for not knowing that in our moment of grief. And had I not actually seen this over and over, I would assume such a statement would speak for itself and not need to be uttered. Room consciousness, consciousness of the spiritual space that we create with our intentionality, apparently includes horribly passe terms such as common decency and ignored pillars of ethics such as that which is reprehensible to you do not do to another. Beyond that, and most importantly for this particular message, room consciousness includes awareness of when our voices can even be heard at all. If I invite myself into someone else's room and then tell them even something that they need to hear, 
that they must hear, that is critical that they hear, it won't be heard. Not without invitation and not without a conscious decision on the part of the person who has created the room that I'm entering to make that space a space where I can comment, where I can contradict. And in reality, the louder I shout, the more the potential necessary communication will 100% inevitably be rejected. That is how the room works. No different than Moses and Aaron appearing unannounced in Pharaoh's room helped Pharaoh make an immediate wise decision. That was sarcasm because the Torah needs the metaphor of the plagues to help us get this. It doesn't matter that let my people go was the right thing that Pharaoh needed to hear. He didn't because he's human. And that wasn't a part of his subjective reality that he'd already chosen to accept as objective truth. And when we are the ones appearing uninvited and getting the inevitable reaction, what is worse is that we will leave that room shaking our heads at the obtuse reactions of our fellow human while failing to look in the mirror and understand that we just prevented someone from hearing something that needed to be heard. When we focus on filling our room with the voices we need to hear and not just the ones we want to hear, we will slowly find ourselves invited into the rooms of those that most need to hear us. Shabbat Shalom. We'll see you next time. בחצות זרות וכל שופר הריאו לפני המלך אדוני